Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Welcome. I am Miguel Martinez Ramos from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. My major scientific work is on population and community ecology of tropical forests in natural and human modified landscapes. I had the pleasure to moderate this lighting session on soils and biochemical cycles in tropical ecosystems. Juan Pablo Narvaez Gomez from the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, will assist us with the technical work for the transmission of this session. We will have the contribution of 10, 10 colleagues from different regions of the planet, each one representing groups of two or more people, persons. I am sure that Lindsay Yang, Valentin Lopez, Cristian Lafont, Elizabeth Camp Ocampo, Jessica Murray, Vinicius Pampermier, Rebecca Oliva, Saris Villamizar, Kim Jin Kim, Miriam San Jose, Francis Breckley will give us very interesting talks. After the talks, we will have a, a live uh, question and answer session with the speakers. And in, for that, I would like to remind you my, that you can submit questions for the speakers at any time during the presentations. But please, please be sure to do so using the Zoom Q and A button and not the question function of the Cuba. Please use Zoom question and answer button. Also, please indicate the name of the speakers to whom the question is directed. We will have uh, more or less 20 minutes for question and answers. And without more to add, please start the presentation from Pablo. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is Lin Zhejiang from Kyoto University. I'm going to introduce our study, the effects of above-ground forest degradation on soil physical chemical properties and microbial activities in leftover tropical rainforest Borneo. Degradation caused by intense logging influences soil pH value, soil moist content, and soil nutrient availability, which reduce the soil organic carbon and nitrogen content of forests. These soil environment factors provide energy for soil microbes and influence their activities. Since soil extracellular enzymes can indicate microbial response to changes, we use four kinds of soil extracellular enzymes as an indicator of microbial activities, include ACP, BG, LAP, and NAG. ACP can catalyze the cleavage of phosphate bonds, BG for degrading cellulose into glucose. LAP for degrading cheating and energy catalytic hydrolysis of cheetoligoscatterides. Our research aimed at exploring the effects of above-ground forest degradation on soil physical chemical properties and microbial activities near a trajectory of degradation, and understanding the relationship among microbial activities, microbial communities, and environmental factors. So we made two hypotheses. First, Soil physical chemical properties and soil microbial activities changed with forest degradation. Second, soil microbial activities might be affected by soil microbial communities and environmental factors. The research sites were chosen in Sabah, Malaysia, Delamakos Forest Reserve, and Tangla Forest Reserve. The basic information are as follows. These two forest reserves have different logging history. In Delamakot, commercial logging started from 1956 to 1989. However, to keep the forest sustainable, reduced impact logging has been implemented since 1996. While in Tan Club, intensive logging continued from the 1970s until 2002. Due to this different, the landsat somatic mapper band 7 image was used to divide the area into the following five degradation strata. The stratum juxtaposed each other and included different landscapes can show a trajectory of forest degradation. Since we have five strata, seven subplots were selected in each stratum. The soil samples were taken by a four-part method. Then we divided total samples into two parts. One part preserved at four degrees, the other one used freeze-drying method. The experiments we made as follow. 
and statics and graphic or use this software. About results, the 35 subplots were spotted by Cooperating Vegetation Impactness Index through AMDS analysis. And AMDS axis 1 is representative of forest degradation. About soil physical chemical properties, with the gravitation of forest degradation, pH value increased. SOC, TN, and CN ratio decreased. Both of them have statistical significance. About soil microbial biomass, with a gravitation of forest degradation, both SMBC and SMBN significantly decreased. With a gravitation of forest degradation, four extracellular enzymes significantly decreased. The relative abundance was calculated and the main failure were identified. At last, we made stepwise regression. Red color were used to show positive relation and blue color were used to show negative relation. Our results improve our hypothesis. First, we suggest that soil physical chemical properties, soil microbial biomass, and communities are affected by forest degradation, which in turn influence the activity of soil extracellular enzyme. We also discuss the correlation between soil physical chemical properties and soil extracellular enzyme, and infer that soil physical chemical properties and soil extracellular enzyme are influenced by each other. Second, the stepwise regression suggests that soil microbes and other environmental factors can influence soil microbial activities. The effects of above-ground forest degradation are transmitted to soil biological chemical functions via the changes of soil physical chemical properties and microbial communities. Above is all that we study. Thank you for watching and look forward to your suggestions and comments. Dear colleagues, today I am going to talk on the effect of altitude and the propagandic press on the total soil respiration in monsoon tropical forests of southern Vietnam. Most forests in Vietnam are replaced by agricultural lands and plantations. Natural monsoon semi deciduous forests are located mainly in the national parks. However, even there, human impact is not completely eliminated. We compare soil respiration in natural tropical forests along the altitudinal gradient and the various levels of anthropogenic impact. Our research was carried out in three national parks of southern Vietnam. The first one is Nam Ca Tien National Park with an altitude about 140 meters. The area is likely affected by recreation. The second is Yogdan National Park with altitude about 230 meters. The level of anthropogenic impact here is rather strong and includes heavy grazing and repeated prescribed burning of dry litter. The third national park is Buziamap with the highest altitude about 430 meters. The area is slightly affected by recreation. In each national park, two samples plots were established in the forest dominated by Dipteracarpus or Logistremia. Total soil respiration was measured during three years at the end of the dry season in February or March and at the end of the wet season in November or December. Soil temperature varied between 23 and 32 centigrade in dry season and changed between 23 and 28 centigrade for the wet season. The lower soil moisture was recorded in the forest plots with heavy grazing and repeated prescribed burning in the Yogdun National Park. In a disturbed forest, soil moisture varied from 13 to 26 volumetric percent in dry season and it was 1.3 to 1.5 times higher during the wet season. The lowest soil respiration rate was observed on both sample plots in the Yogdo National Park, characterized by the lowest soil moisture caused by heavy grazing and the absence of litter. The sufficiently moist soil in the Buziamap National Park demonstrated the highest respiration rate. In comparison with the dry period, 
The soil respiration rate during the wet season increased by 1.4 1.9 times in the Namkaitian and Buzyamap national parks and by three times in the Dipterocarpus forest in the Yogdon National Park. The dominating three species did not influence the soil respiration rate except the forest under the prescribed burning and grazing. Soil moisture was responsible for the difference between total soil respiration rate during the dry and wet season in the in disturbed forest and explained it 64% of total soil respiration variability. This pattern was not observed in the forest under strong anthropogenic impact. We didn't observe an effect of altitude in the total soil respiration values. Thanks for attention. Greetings everyone, I'm Tristan Lafourapnoui and I will present to you the main results of my master thesis during which I investigated the effects of substrate quality on tongue bromeliad habitats and their freshwater organisms. Bromeliads are a hyperdiverse neotropical plant family and about half of the family have a rosette of overlapping leaves that forms tank, a tank storing water and organic matter falling from the overhanging canopy. And is, this organic matter is at the base of a complete aquatic ecosystem with microorganisms, detritivores, and predators, a system that produces nutrients that are then directly absorbed by the leaves through specialized structure, the leaf absorbing trichomes. This enables tongue bromeliads to thrive in nutrient poor environment, such as epiphytic. But the tank isn't the only source of nutrient, as it was first believed, and recent studies showed that roots weren't only reduced to anchorage functions, but might also contribute to tank bromeliad nutrition. However, it remained unclear if this root contribution to nutrient acquisition has significant effect on plant growth, and if these effects could cascade to the tank and its functioning. Indeed, tank communities and functionings are strongly influenced by plant morphology, as it affects tank features such as water depth, water volume, water pH, or temperature. For instance, plant morphological response to light have been shown to affect its tank communities. So here we wanted to test if root nutrition was important enough to impact one, plant growth and phenotype, and two, tank characteristic and aquatic microbial communities. We decided to test this in a simple greenhouse experiment. We sowed seeds from Acmea aquilega, a tank bromeliad known to have roots with some absorptive capacities in three types of soil. A poor one being 100% white sand, a rich one being peat, and an even mix. Plants were grown for 15 months and we then assess their performances, morphology, photosynthetic capacities, chemistry, as well as their tank water content and pH, and density in bacteria, picoeukaryotes, and picocyanobacteria. So here are the results of a PCA made on all measured roots and leaf traits. And we can see that the analysis discriminates plants from the poor soil on the left from plants from richer soils on the right. Here, only the top contributing variables are displayed, and these are mainly morphological rather than physiological traits. And indeed, soil richness had a striking effect on plant size and morphology. It induced a severe dwarfism on plants from poor soils, with, for instance, the rosette diameter that gradually increased from 10 centimeters to 40 centimeters with soil richness, and plants from white sand having less and shorter leaves. The effects of soil richness on plant morphology affected in turn tank characteristic, with small plants having less water and less acidic tanks. And as we saw, these changes cascaded to tank microbial communities. If not striking, our results show that soil richness affected bacteria and picoeukaryotes density, while picocyanobacteria density remained the same between the three treatments. There's are preliminary results that need to be confirmed in future work with better taxonomic and functional resolution. But our work showed that soil richness via root nutrition 
can affect both the plant and the associated microbial communities. In natural ecosystems, these microorganisms are the base of the complex tank food web, and this could affect the whole tank functioning and look back again to the plant nutrition in this closed interacting system. To conclude, aquatic microorganisms were mediated by cross kingdom interactions that could be an important force driving aquatic community structuring and overall tank and plant functioning. Thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank the SIVA for its financial support and all my collaborators, as well as the ATBC for this event and opportunity. Feel free to ask the questions and have a great day. Hello, everybody. I hope you are doing well. My name is Elizabeth Campo Montoya, and this is a brief presentation about our research soil respiration response to temperature in Andean forests in science for assessing environmental change consequences. This was a project directed by the University of Exeter and supported by the University of Leeds, Universidad de Antioquia, and Australian National University. As context for this research, tropical forest stores 25% of the world's carbon stocks. From this percentage, the tropical forest soils hold 32% of carbon, also they occupy only 12 to 15% of the continental surface. Particularly, the increase in the average global temperature can evidence climate change. However, recent studies have suggested that in future de decades, tropical forests can switch from carbon six to carbon source in response to changing environmental conditions with profound implications for the global carbon cycle. Most of the studies were carried out in lowland humid forests. However, there, there are other tropical forests such as those in Andes that also play an important role in the carbon cycle and very little is currently known about their soil respiration sensitivity to future warming. As methods, we implemented an experimental thermosequence in the Colombian Andes that uses elevation as a proxy for warming. Control site with a warming. The second site represented a warming of plus A Celsius degrees, and the third site that represented a warming of plus 12 Celsius degrees. In each site, we used an IRGA, that means infrared gas analyzer, to quantify the soil respiration. Finally, we separated total soil respiration into autotrophic and heterotrophic respiration and we calculated Q10 values, the factor by which soil respiration increases for every 10 degree rise in temperature to determine the warming sensitivity of soil respiration. As a result, we found to that total respiration is higher at the warming side, which indicates that the total soil respiration increases with the warming. As a result of heterotropic respiration, we found that for plus 8 site, the Q10 is 2, and for plus 12 site, the Q10 is 3. This means that for the greater increased temperature, the heterotropic respiration can increase faster. And as results of autotrophic respiration, we found that in general is higher at the warming side, but not all the species respond equally. The species with the highest sensitivity is Quercus humboldti, and the least is Teuchina lepidota. As conclusions, the no linearity effect of temperature on soil respiration indicate the potential for switching to carbon source may be more intense than projected. And finally, there is a challenge in the management of tropical and forests for their high climatic sensitivity and their future function in the carbon cycle. 
Thank you very much for your attention. I will be paying attention just in case you have a comment about my research project. And here below, I will let the reference about my research. So, thank you again. Greetings. I'm going to talk briefly uh, about some preliminary data I have from a study investigating the factors controlling canopy soil carbon losses. So canopy soils form on tree branches and wet forests. They're histosols. They're completely organic, essentially humus. And I decided to investigate um, a handful of factors that might influence uh, carbon losses in the form of microbial soil respiration of CO2. So I looked at temperature, moisture, nutrient um, additions, and labile carbon addition in the form of glucose. And I did this study in two sites in Costa Rica, two primary forests, a lowland rainforest, the La Selva, and a middle elevation cloud forest, Monteverde. Uh, in five or six trees at each site, I installed soil temperature and moisture sensors, and I did experimental additions of either nitrogen and phosphorus, or glucose, or just water, and I did these in the form of injections into the soil. And I recorded CO2 response um, uh, using this DIY Arduino-based uh, CO2 sensor chamber, as well as headspace samples that I took and analyzed on our Picaro gas analyzer. And we found that temperature and moisture interacted to influence CO2 respiration. So this is an interaction graph. Um, soil moisture is on the x-axis, respiration on the y, and the lines are soil temperature. So we have the mean soil temperature in the middle. Um, and you can see that when temperature was lower, so at cooler temperatures, or as you can see with the lighter dotted line, when temperature was a standard deviation below the mean, soil moisture actually had a negative impact on CO2 respiration. However, I'm suspicious this um, interaction might be confounded by site differences, um, because as you can see, the lowland rainforest and the cloud forest site didn't overlap at all in soil temperature. So it's possible that the temperature interaction um, might have something to do with some other confounding site factor. Um, in terms of the experimental additions of glucose and, nit and nutrients, um, there was a lot of variability in CO2 respiration rates. And so um, we didn't get many clear patterns. Uh, there were no significant treatment effects in the cloud forest site in Monteverde. But oddly, um, at La Selva, there was a general suppression of CO2 respiration with glucose addition, which is really odd. Um, you would usually expect glucose to stimulate CO2 respiration whether that's by priming the soil organic matter or just, you know, because the microbes have a pulse of carbon that they're decomposing. So I'm not really sure what that's about. Um, but this graph is not split by site, but it shows um, each line is a treatment and the X axis are the time points. So I measured response of CO2 before, after, two hours after, and a day after adding um, each treatment. Again, you can see the variation is tremendous, um, uh, but you can see that interestingly, glucose was generally suppressed with, you can't really see the error bars, but a lot of variability, but that it returned to baseline. You can also see that um, there was a non-significant, but somewhat of a dip in nutrient, in CO2 respiration in response to nutrient addition um, with a return to baseline, or in some cases, higher than baseline respiration rates. So in conclusion of just this little bit of data, um, we found the effect of soil moisture on CO2 respiration depends on temperature or maybe confounding site differences. We found the response of CO2 respiration to glucose addition differed by site. And we found a lot of variability in CO2 respiration rates probably due to the high microsite heterogeneity in the canopy. So the background photo here is a branch covered in a bunch of different functional groups of epiphytes, mosses, et cetera. So I'm, I suspect that that 
high heterogeneity led to a lot of variation in CO2 respiration responses. Um, next up is I did add 13C labeled glucose. So once I have my soil analyses done, I can calculate um, the extent of soil organic matter priming. Um, but for now, that's what I have. And I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Vinicius. I am a PhD in ecology at the University of Brazil, and here I'm going to present to you how fertilization in lining can reduce and displace columbulans isotope finish, which could be a potential indicator of nutrient input into central Brazilian savannas. The Brazilian savanna, locally known as Cerrado, is a global biodiverse hotspot due to its high levels of above ground plant and animal species richness, high degree of endemism, and accelerated habitat loss. This is because Cerrado is also an agricultural frontier and had about 46% of its native vegetation converted mainly to pastures for livestock, but also to annual croplands. Together with plowing, liming, fertilization, and exotic grasses cultivation, which hinders the native savanna restoration in abandoned agricultural areas, agriculture activities expand to models that contribute to reactive nitrogen and phosphorus emissions into the atmosphere, which may lead to its consequent deposition into the native savanna remnants. Estimates suggest that nitrogen deposition into Cerrado may more than double by 2050. Outcomes of long-term experiment of nutrient addition into a woodland savanna have been showing that in addition to promoting lasting changes in soil chemistry, these nutrients can modify plant diversity and cover, promote exotic grass invasion, alter litter quality and decomposition, and affect the soil microbial diversity. All this represents change in the quantity and quality of resource that support soil food webs in their functions, affecting soil trophic interactions in ways we do not know yet. To begin understanding whether the legacy of nutrient addition into the savanna may have compromised soil food web interactions, we took a closer look at what columbians are doing. This is because columbulum are among the most widespread and abundant soil articles, inhabiting various organic substrates and using a wide range of food resources. Acting at the base of the food web, columbulums contribute to nutrient cycling and channel carbon to high trophic levels. Stable isotope analysis have been showing pronounced trophic niche differentiation among columbian species in temperate and tropical forests, and this differentiation in large has been explained by the taxonomic identity of columbians. Here, by accessing the isotope composition of common EPJ columbians between treatments and normalize the delta 30C and 15 values of columbians by the local literature delta values of each treatment, we applied descriptive metrics based on stable isotopes and found that columbians were accessing less diverse basal resources in NMP treatments compared to control. And as with liming, a large proportion of columbian assemblage members in NMP treatments had similar trophic preference. It culminated in a reduction in isotope niche width of the columbian assemblage. And analyze the standard ellipses in the bike plot, we also noticed the displacement of the isotope condition of columbial assemblies in N plus B and lining, which may represent the influence of exotic grasses with C4 photosynthetic cycle that invaded this treatment. So our study suggests that increasing nitrogen and phosphor deposition into native savannas or the liming legacy in restored savanna soils may impact columbian niche structure, and this can have consequences for the ecosystem functioning in ways we do not know yet. But for now, our outcomes bring perspectives on the use of carbon and nitrogen stable isotope metrics on columbians as indicators of nutrient input into savanna ecosystems. 
and these indicators could help us detect the expected nitrogen deposition crease into savannas and assess whether the savanna restoration in abandoned agriculture areas effectively restores the soil food web interactions. So thank you very much for your attention and all the best for all of you. Hello everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Rebecca Lemieliva. I am a Master's in Environmental Sciences by the Federal University of São Carlos in Brazil. And I'm here to talk a little bit about my master's thesis in which we studied compute advantage effects on the composition of leaf litter in tropical riparian forests. But first, what is compute advantage or HFA? This is a theory that comes from the sports world and explains the team's higher performance when playing at home rather than away. But I'm not here to talk about football. So in ecosystem ecology, how does this translate? Uh, imagine you have two ecosystems, A and B, and I take litter from A and put it to decompose in both A and B. The HFA theory states that this litter will decompose at a more accelerated rate at home rather than away, and this will happen because the decomposer community from its home environment has adapted through time to decompose that specific litter that falls in its home environment. Okay. In this study, then, we took riparian forests under restoration and forest remnants, and we analyzed the influence of litter quality, soil nutrients, successional stage or age since active restoration on mass loss and HFA. For that, we have five hypotheses. Three of them were independent experiments in which we uh, carried out reciprocal translocation experiments, uh, which are illustrated in the right hand side of the slide. Hypothesis 1 assessed the effect of litter quality and or soil nutrients in forests under restoration. Hypothesis 2, the effect of age. And hypothesis 3, the effect of litter quality and or soil nutrients in natural ecosystem. As I said, those were independent experiments and generated independent data sets. And we used those independent uh, experiments uh, combined to test hypothesis 4 and 5. Hypothesis 4 aimed to assess the effect of specific nutrients on HFA effects, and Hypothesis 5, the effect of the difference or dissimilarity between home and away areas on HFA effects. Regarding our results, uh, in the first three hypotheses, we found a very limited effect of HFA in areas under restoration, and we also found a very limited effect of litter quality, forest age, and soil nutrients on HFA effects. We did, however, find a positive effect of decomposability in R1, one of our areas, leading to a higher decomposition rate at that specific place. Decomposability is an intrinsic capacity of decomposers to break down all kinds of litter, regardless of how recalcitrant they are. Uh, and we attributed this result to the fact that R1 has a more structured forest, uh, this means that it has more input of high quality, quality litter, and this allowed decomposers to develop this higher ability. Uh, in our fourth hypothesis, we found a positive correlation between HFA and litter NP. This means that higher HFA values were found in litters with higher qualities. Uh, litter NP ratios, they can indicate whether a process is and or P limited. And untangling the role of P limitation in HFA effects in tropical forests, which are considered to be often P limited when compared to uh, temperate ones, can help us understand how microbial communities adapt over time. And in our fifth hypothesis, we found a positive correlation between HFA and soil dissimilarity. This means that higher HFA effects were found in areas with soils that were more dissimilar, which we didn't expect. We actually expected uh, litter dissimilarity to have more influence. But however, this can't be uh, explained by the soil matrix interaction hypothesis. What was interesting, though, in these results was that the more similar areas that had more negative or limited HFA effects were restored areas, and the more dissimilar areas were the, in the areas that had more positive HFA effects were remnant areas. Uh, so those are our main results, and they lead us to conclude that HFA effects are extremely context-dependent and can be influenced by a number of factors. However, it's still important to study more how HFA effects uh, 
influence the composition rates in tropical ecosystems, especially in restored forests, because this will help us understand how ecosystem processes recover over time, and in turn will help us monitor better forests under restoration, making sure that not only their vegetation is restored, but also all of their ecosystem processes. So those were the references that I used, and thank you so much for coming. Good afternoon, my name is Sarit Villamizar, and I'm going to present our work entitled Species Composition and Climate Dynamics Drive Above Ground Wood Productivity in Tropical Forests of Colombia. This work was carried out by myself in collaboration with Dr. Bjorn Roy from Industrial University of Santander and Dr. Esteban Alvarez from the National and at Distance Open University from Colombia. Tropical forests are an important component of the carbon cycle. They account for one third of global net primary productivity because of favorable conditions for plant growth, such as relatively stable and benign climate, high and constant amounts of solar radiation throughout the year, and high levels of biodiversity. Here in Colombia, the Andes divide into three mountain ranges, giving rise to a diversity of forest ecosystems, a wide range of climatic conditions, including their temporal dynamics, like El, El Niño Southern Oscillation, and high levels of beta diversity, which makes Colombia an ideal place to study the effect of climate and biodiversity on forest growth. Here we analyze the effect of climate and biodiversity on the dynamics of growth above ground wood productivity across 20 forest plots located in different ecoregions of Colombia over the last 22 years. To do this, we gather data from forestplots.net from 20 plots that were surveyed between 1996 and 2018. The plots included more than 14,000 trees and were censused between two and six times. They cover an altitudinal range from 10 to 2,600 meters above sea level and have a high variation in temperature and precipitation. We use the type two allometric equations of Alvarez et al. 2012 to estimate above ground biomass. These equations were developed for Colombian forests and take into account wood density, diameter at breadth height, and life zone. We found on average 159 megagrams of dry biomass per hectare. Uh, we estimated above ground wood productivity for growth recruitment and mortality and found a net average value of 0 0.29 megagrams of carbon per hectare per year. We also determined the importance of eight climatic variables associated with the temporal dynamics of temperature and precipitation and four biodiversity variables using linear mix effect models and variable selection. We found parsimonious models with fixed effects that explained more variance than the null model. And after controlling for side effect, our results show that growth above ground wood productivity is controlled by both biotic and abiotic variables. The most significant variable was the species composition, followed by temperature variability. Precipitation and temperature trends indicating climatic changes had a weak but significant effect. Variables such as species richness, channel diversity, mean annual temperature, and annual precipitation had no explanatory power in our analysis, which contradicts previous findings in tropical forests. Finally, as main conclusions, we have that species composition plays a key role in productivity, climate change is likely to have a positive impact on forest productivity, and neotropical forests of Colombia are able to maintain high productivity levels across a wide range of climatic conditions. We would like to thank to the principal researchers of the plots included in this study and all the people who participated in the plot censuses and contributed the data that made this work possible. These are the references cited in this presentation. Thanks for your time.
soil carbon stock across climate zones is proved to change as a response to variation of vegetation. However, without climate gradient, what result can a shift in above-ground vegetation brings to soil carbon stock is left unclear. A large part of forests in Southeast Asia consists of degraded or logged over forests due to clear cutting or selective logging for timber production. The extensive forest degradation and the hereby emerged negative impacts, including impeded vegetation recovery, lower biodiversity and ecosystem service level have been observed and studied in former researches within this area. Soil, exists as a large carbon sink with no direct monitoring method, keeps absent in most forest degradation assessments according to the FRA report 2020. One reason here is that not only above ground biomass, but also pedogenic characteristics and soil microbiome activities, determine soil carbon stock as a difference between carbon input and output. Conceptually, soil carbon content mainly origins from litter fall and other dead plant debris, which is generally called the organic matters. Fresh debris will then be decomposed under a variety of physical, chemical, faunal and microbial processes, turns into smaller molecules of organic carbon. Such molecules interact with pedogenic minerals, including crystalline ones like gibbsite, or those formed by amorphous iron or aluminum, like allophane, imogalite and ferrohydrite. These secondary minerals associate with organic carbon, in terms of adsorption, complexation or aggregation, which as a whole is called soil carbon stabilization. It is stabilization that reduces the bioaccessibility of humus, in other words kept it from loss by respiration, erosion or leaching. This study aims at establishing a better understanding of how soil carbon stock may change responding to above-ground biomass loss. Field research was conducted in two tropical timber-producing forest reserves, Duramakot and Tonkulap, Saba, Malaysia in the year 2020. Logging events of different intensities occurred in the last 30 years, where secondary succession is observed here to be obstructed by intensive conventional logging. 36 plots belonging to five different vegetation classes were sampled basing on satellite stratum map and prior studies in the same area. To be specific, class 1 and 2 represent forests undergone no or reduced impact logging, a new logging technique considering sustainability. Class 3 stands for forests where excessive conventional logging happened, while class 4 forests are further degraded comparing with class 3. Class 5 cannot be named as forest but area occupied by fern that invaded after clear cutting. Plots were either square or circular, 20 meters wide at sides or diameter. The solid green spots represent individual trees with a diameter at breast height over 10 centimeters located within the plot. Soil sample was collected at the center of each plot. A 50 centimeters depth soil sample was collected with a 10 centimeters depth, 3.5 centimeters width increment. We collected data for both vegetation at plot level and pedant. Trees with over 10 cm dbh were recorded and identified at species level, preparing for NMDS analysis illustrating species composition differences among the plots. Total soil carbon and nitrogen, amorphous iron and aluminum, crystalline iron and aluminum, soil pH, mass moisture content and bulk density were measured following standard methods. Hierarchically, Plot vegetation was identified from class 1, primary, to class 5, fern and vine. The NMDS axis 1 values identically distribute according to degradation level, thus adapted as the degradation indicator in following analyses. A positive relationship was found between intactness and soil carbon stock, and a significant negative relationship between intactness and soil pH. Amorphous iron concentration also closely linked with both intactness and carbon concentration, in the top 30 cm soil. The results can be summarized as follows. Soil scientists may find these results inspiring. Deforestation or forest degradation are basically understood as above-ground biomass loss and species composition shift, but changes also occur in the below-ground regime, including loss of carbon stock as well as carbon stabilization minerals. Causation of such phenomenon is still unclear, we hypothesize that weakened transpiration may lead to soil reduction and thus dissolution of iron and aluminum minerals binding organic carbon. Above all, impacts of such pedogenic changes can be seen as irreversible. The restoration of soil carbon stock in terms of stabilization capacity, or even reforestation considering nutrition circulation, can be called into question.
Hi, my name is Miriam San Jose, and I'm going to present large tree mortality leads to major above ground biomass decline in a tropical forest reserve. Humans are transforming the ecology of the planet by changing the land use and the climate. Only 15% of terrestrial surface is protected. And while these areas are crucial for biodiversity conservation, evidence remains inconclusive on how good are reserves for preserving plant community structure beyond diversity. This is particularly important in tropical forests, which nowadays are the most deforested and biodiverse regions and an important carbon sink that helps to regulate the global climate. So here we evaluate temporal and spatial mechanisms driving changes in plant community structure. This is abundance, diversity, composition and biomass of early successional and old growth species in a forest dynamics plot in southern Costa Rica. This is the Las Cruces Reserve. Within this reserve in the center of the old growth forest area in 2008, a permanent plot was established. And here all woody plants equal to more than five centimeters DBH were measured, identified, mapped and classified into early successional or old growth species according to their life traits. We made three surveys in 2010, five years later and 10 years later in 2020. We recorded almost 5,000 individuals and 245 species. As expected in a preserved forest, we found more old growth species than early successional species, but the later increased the richness and abundance over the study period. Um, the old growth species show almost no changes in diversity. Although the species richness was maintained, we observed greater losses than gains in biomass. In the figure, you can see in the left side, the top five species with the greatest increases in biomass. Some of them with the greatest increases in the number of individuals too, as you can see by in these numbers above the bars. Some of these species are subwood species that do not storage many carbon, as Otoa novogranatensis and Ampea pendiculata. On the right side are the top five species with the greatest decreases in biomass. These species are hardwood species, for example, those from the Lauraci family, which are characteristic of these forests. Here, the greatest losses in biomass are driven mainly by the loss of few individuals, particularly very large trees with a DBH larger than 40 centimeters. The death of these large trees is creating many gaps and changing the structure of this forest. As you can see here, Ampea pendiculata, which is represented by, by these dots, is an early successional species that has enormously increased its abundance in the plot from 17 individuals in 2010 to more than, 100, uh, than 240 individuals in 2020. And this is strongly associated to the gaps created by large dead trees, which are indicated by the red areas. But why are large trees dying in this reserve, which has not direct human disturbance? Well, a possible explanation is climate change. Here you can see the climate trends in the region. The upper part shows a drought index in blue and red, being red the drought periods. The black line indicates the Oceanic Nino index. As you can see, for most of the study period, it has been dry and two extreme ev climate events occurred. A La Nina in 2011 and a strong El Nino in 2015. Also, the maximum temperature has increased and the soil uh, moisture has decreased over the last 10 years. There's plenty of evidence that drought disproportionately affects large trees due to the hydraulic failure. So this combined with extreme climate events could be causing the loss of larger trees within this reserve and ends the loss of biomass. This pattern is pervasive across tropical forest reserves. It could hamper efforts to preserve forest structure and ecosystem services, such as carbon storage. So monitoring programs could better assess carbon trends in reserves over time simply by tracking large tree dynamics. I'll be happy to answer any question. And thank you very much. So hi everyone, thanks for listening to this lightning talk where we're looking at how the expansion of oil palm plantations in Southeast Asia is leading to increasing pig populations that then travel into so-called undisturbed 
primary forest and impact on various other ecological processes and other taxa, including the forest soil microbial communities. And they're traveling at least a kilometer into the forest. So what we're seeing here is a far reaching edge effect. So Matt Luskin, who's the senior author on this presentation, has already described how expansion of oil palm plantations leads to food subsidies, increasing pig populations, and the reduction in predators is also leading to increasing pig populations that are having various ecological effects in the undisturbed forest. And we've also shown that earlier that the expansion of oil palm plantations leads to large changes in soil properties and therefore influencing the soil microbial communities. So if we tie these two together, then we can see that we can hypothesize that the increase in pig populations is going to be impacting upon the various soil microbes through, uh, through the addition of feces and urine to the forest soil, through their grubbing processes where they dig around in the soil, and through removing stems where they basically break and snap them and build nests. So we used an exclosure experiment that was established 21 years prior to our sampling. And you can see on the left, the areas within the exclosure where we've got a uh, denser uh, vegetation compared to the area on the right, which is outside the exclosure. And we simply sampled soils within and outside these exclosures, extracted DNA, sequenced them on an Illumina sequencer using uh, 16S or looking for 16S for bacteria and ITS2 for fungi. So in terms of microbial diversity, the first thing to note is that we see a significant reduction in the diversity of bacteria in the areas that are exclosed. In terms of fungal diversity, however, we don't see any differences in the overall community diversity. But when we look at ectomycorrhizal fungi, so these symbiotic fungi that help with nutrient uptake and are associated with diprocarps, which are very important in these forests of Southeast Asia, we see indications of an increase in exomycorrhizal diversity. So if we now look at the soil microbial community structure for bacteria, fungi, and ectomycorrhizal fungi, what we have here is three NMDS ordination diagrams that are showing the differences in the community structure of these three different groups of microbes. So if we, first of all, we look at the soil bacteria, what we see is that these polygons are not overlapping. So we've got a significant difference in the bacterial communities between the open areas and the exclosed areas. And the other thing to note is these uh, red arrows indicate soil properties that are having a significant effect on the microbial communities. So in this case, soil pH, potassium, loss of ignition, and the water content. So what we're seeing here is actually only pH is significantly different between the exclosed and the open areas. So it's a small but significant difference. So that suggests that the, the change in soil pH, perhaps, uh, perhaps mediated by uh, differences in uh, leaf litter de deposition, is influencing the bacterial community here. If we look at the soil fungal community, well, the polygons are overlapping quite a bit. So we've not got significant differences in the fungal community between the, the exclosures and the open areas. And whilst they're influenced by the soil loss and ignition and the water content, these aren't different between the open and the exclosed areas. If we then look at our exomycorrhizal fungal community, what we see is that actually none of the soil factors are significantly influencing the community. There's a little bit of overlap. But again, the communities are significantly different you know, between the exclosures and the open areas. And we're suggesting here that actually what's happening is earlier been shown that, that pigs preferentially remove diprocarps that are associated with these ectomycorrhizal fungi. So the removal of diprocarps by pigs is influencing the ectomycorrhizal community structure. So we've got far reaching edge effects mediated by increasing pig populations that are expanding due to feeding on the oil palm fruit and from the plantations around the, this particular reserve. And we see that they then travel into the forest, at least a kilometer into the forest, and they're influence, influencing soil microbes, particularly soil bacteria, they're influenced by minor changes in soil pH in the pig affected soils. They're not affecting the fungal community overall, but ectomycorrhizal fungi are also influenced by pigs, probably due to the preferential removal of ectomycorrhizal associated diprocarps by pigs. And of course, this is then going to have implications for biogeochemistry and community assembly, and how this is affected by African swine fever in the future is something that we should be uh, looking out for.
Okay, thank you very much for these wonderful presentations. We enjoy very much the, the new information provided is for these studies. And we will start with the question and answer session. And I have uh, three from the attendees. Mm, Anne Russell is asking to Jessica, uh, could suppression of respiration with glucose reflect a great, greater limitation on nitrogen rather than carbon? That's, that is what I found in, in a field experiment in La Selva. Could you comment on this, Jessica? Thank you, Anne. Um, that is a really good point. I would have thought that um, if nitrogen were limiting that um, there would have been an increase in respiration in response to the nitrogen and phosphorus addition. Um, but I did not add that together with carbon. So um, I'll have to think about that. Thank you for that comment. Okay, thank you. And Adriana Corrales Osorio asked to Vinicius, uh, do you, and this is that what's very interesting talk. Thank you, Vinicius. Do you think that the changes in isotopic niche of Colembola is a result of changes in food sources or changes in isotopic composition of food sources or both? Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. It's a good question. And for now, we think it's a change in food sources. And we suspect that, that both, both the shrink, shrinkage of Colembola niche uh, in the treatment with uh, nitrogen addition, as well the displacement of the niche in N plus P and lime treatment reflect changes in, uh, in, in plant cover. Right? Uh, uh, because uh, where C3 plants uh, were favored in, in plots with uh, nitrogen, uh, while plots with uh, N plus P and lime, there was an invasion of C4 grasses. So we think the, it is a, a, a change in food sources. But uh, however, in the context of soil columbulus, uh, this change in carbon isotope values uh, can reflect uh, feeding on freshly or processed uh, uh, organic matter by my, by microbes. So we um, we need to investigate this further. But um, think about it now. Uh, I guess we can dismiss the idea that it could be a change in isotopic composition of the food source. So you raise it. You raise it a good question for us to investigate it, it further. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, thank you, Vinicius. Okay, I have another question. This is from one uh, attendee that is uh, not indicated the name, but it's for Miriam. Um, this how we spread is this phenomenon: your relationship with mortality and drought, or do you think it is more relevant to regions which are experiencing more extreme or frequent drought events? Then the question is how. What spreads is your, your findings? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, according to what I've read, um, there is plenty of evidence that uh, in the Amazon forest, this is happening. So um, there they have found uh, the effects of, of these uh, extreme climate events such as La Nina and, and El Nino. Mm -hmm. And what they say is that, uh, well, drought periods affect uh, disproportionately uh, large trees because of a hydraulic failure. So after a drought period, when it comes like uh, wind storms or heavy rains, this uh, could further uh, affect these trees, um, causing them to, to die. No? So, um, uh, yeah, what I found is mostly for the Amazon uh, rainforest. And what I think is that 
uh, this is particularly relevant in tropical areas and mainly the areas that are uh, uh, very much affected by these extreme events such as La Niña and El Niño. Mm -hmm. Yes, Miriam, we have another study in Mexico that is uh, taking like 25 years and we, the, we have uh, very much uh, similar results as yours. Thank you. Yeah. And Lindsay Young, I have a question for you. Um, yes. And um, my question is what other factors besides forest degradation explain the variability yes. or the variation in soil properties and microbial activity? Because I noted that your R squared values mm -hmm. were yes. explaining less than 50. 56% of the variation, which is, and sometimes it's very good, no? And another where, where like a 20 or 50% of the variation. Mm -hmm. What are other factors could be more in this? Well, uh, I, I just uh, introduced the history, uh, the login history about, the, about my uh, research plot. So maybe the first things is the, human uh, activities to uh, affect the variation and the other maybe uh, in this result we although we research some uh, microbe microbes include fungi and uh, fungi and bacteria but maybe maybe we need to pay more attention between the uh, above ground vegetation and the and the uh, uh, microbes, the link, the, the link between the above ground and vegetation. So, uh, in the future, I what I thought is uh, first is the is to uh, put the vegetation. We 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 have just uh, uh, investigate the the genus about the uh, about in our plot. So, mm -hmm. how the vegetation to uh, they make some. Uh, influence on, on the variation is um, maybe we need to, uh, to to do the more research on it and another one uh, we, we just um, think about the the residents in the ecosystem so is there still some like the uh, the residents this concept to make, make some change in, in, in our plot maybe need to be to be researched in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Thank um, you. Juan Pablo, how, how much time do we have? We have? We have five minutes. Five minutes? Yes, five. Okay, thank you. Bueno, <laughs> I have a lot of questions here, but uh, let's start advance. For Rebe Rebecca? And I wonder whether your result depends on the combination of the leaf of different species, or you select randomly the litter for your experiments. Uh, in our experiment, we use the litter, mixed litter that fall uh, into the areas. We collected it over like two or three months, and then we mixed it all and put it to decompose. So the effect that we see is the effect of mixed litter in all plots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I suppose that the leaf properties no, may change from one species to another. You are using, for example, preferentially the dominant species and not the rare species and so on, will change a little bit no, your, your results. But may, Yeah, know. yeah, definitely. But the areas that we, we studied, actually, uh, we not only don't have like a species, uh, uh, like definition on them. We don't know how, what species are, how many species there are, but they are also very different from each other. So we did like a quantitative analysis on litter properties like uh, NC, phosphorus concentrations, all that. Uh, and we tested all of that uh, as factors into like ANOVAs to see if anything had an effect, but <laughs> neither of it had. <laughs> So we were thinking on the lines that maybe like plant soil interactions uh, if, have a greater effect on plant soil interactions, you know, so there may be bigger factors uh, taking place here. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, for Christian. 
there is very interesting story on the uh, mea bromeliads. Uh, the, these bromeliads are uh, growing on the ground or on the branches of trees. Uh, we can find them uh, in the proposed locations. Uh, often they have to grow and germinate on trees. Uh -huh. But what happens is that they fell on the ground and then they have no problem to thrive on the ground. Okay, yes, because um, I wonder this this bromelts uh, produce uh, sprouts or new individuals from ramets from vegetative growth. Yeah. Yeah, then could be interesting to, to do the experiment replicating uh, genotypes by producing uh, different ramets uh, or families of ramets and see whether there is some kind of genetic variation influences the responses in size. Mm, yeah, it, it could be really interesting. We, we tried to control for the genetic factor by using uh, seeds from one uh, mother plant. Okay, so but you have replicas of the fam of the families. Yeah, we, we have one bromelet species, and all the seed that we used in all our treatments were from one plant. So we okay. reduced uh, as much as possible the genetic factor, but that could play a role. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, it has to be tested yet. Yeah, because this is a very nice avenue to, of research to understand what is the sources of this variation. Is only plasticity or have some genetic variation due to the uh, different types of branches in which the bromelias can establish, depending on the properties of the branches and so on, different species of trees and so on. I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot to be done yet uh, with these plants. Mm -hmm. And there is a huge natural uh, ecological uh, variability, physiological variability, there are more than 3,000 species. So if we were to mm -hmm. investigate it properly, we would need uh, lots of replicates of different species and variation within the species. So it was really exploratory study to try to, mm -hmm. to link these plants, their environments and the, the tank communities. But yeah, uh, okay, a, a lot of things to do. Okay, thank you. And um, Valentin Lopez. Valentin. Uh, I I can try to answer on behalf of Valentin. I'm Yekaterina. Okay, Yekaterina. I'm a co-author of this study. Okay, thank you. Um, and my question is whether you have some. Um, control of the topography where the the plots were established because you have the different elevations, no? Three elevations. Yeah, that was uh, one of the objective of our study to um, reveal the possible altitudinal effect on soil respiration. Yes, yes, because uh, if you repeat, for example, the the same study with the different slopes or different positions. Uh, we uh, we try to avoid slopes. We uh, uh, we choose um, more or less more or less flat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because uh, these uh, slopes and position may change the the, the conditions yeah. where the yeah. soil properties. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry to interrupt you. We are over time now. It says it's over now. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, but I, well, no. I, I'm happy to, to tell more if uh, it's interesting. Yeah, that, that I, I have more questions for the other person that were not have no yeah. possibility to, to, to. Well, okay, thank you very much for your presentation. It was a very nice uh, session. I hope that you enjoyed this and see you soon, maybe in the next ATVC meeting in Colombia. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you, Miguel. Bye. Thank you.